Hi guys, it's Miss Ramani again, and this week we're going to learn about a type of genetics called Mendelian genetics. Now, Mendelian genetics helps us understand some of the most basic rules that govern how traits are inherited from one generation to the next. And by now you know that most of your traits, from your eye color to the shape of your earlobe, are influenced by genes found on your DNA. And that DNA is organized into chromosomes that is found in the nucleus of all your cells. You also know that those genes were passed on to you by your parents. But in the 1800s, this information was not known by anyone. But that did not stop an Austrian monk experimenting with pea plants from figuring out the rules by which genes are inherited. His name was Gregor Mendel, the father of genetics. Between 1856 and 1863, Gregor Mendel, an Austrian monk, grew and studied pea plants. What Mendel learned during those seven years with his pea plants changed everything people knew about genetics at the time. More astoundingly, at a time before the discovery of DNA or even the discovery of the microscope, Mendel was able to draw conclusions about genetics that formed the foundation of modern genetics. So Mendel worked with pea plants. Now, pea plants have a variety of very clear traits, which made them a perfect subject for him to do his experiments with. Uh, for example, seed color. You're familiar with green pea plants. Well, the peas that you eat are the seeds of the pea plant, and we're, you know most of the time we eat green peas. But there's also yellow peas. And not only are pea seeds round all the time, sometimes they can also be wrinkled. So there's differences in the shapes of the seeds. There can also be differences in the pod. The pods can be what we call inflated, but they can also be what we call deflated pods. And the pods don't always have to be green. They could also be yellow, either yellow deflated or yellow inflated pods. And there are also differences in flower color. There's some pea plants that have purple flowers and some that have white flowers. And there's also differences in height. And unlike a lot of other plants, pea plants really just have two heights, tall, or short, which Mendel called dwarf plants. So as you can see for each trait, there seems to be two very easily distinguishable forms. So when Mendel did his experiments, he studied the inheritance of seed shape first. He started by mating with each other, or what he would call crossing with each other. Seeds from purebred smooth plants and seeds from purebred wrinkled plants. What does that mean? A purebred is essentially a plant that would have only shown a particular trait for multiple generations. So when he took the plant that would produce smooth seeds, he took a plant who came from a series of generations that had only produced smooth seeds, and he called those purebred. And when he took the, took the plant that produced wrinkle seeds, he took that plant that produced wrinkle seeds from a plant that had produced wrinkle seeds for many, many generations. So he called that again a purebred. And when we demonstrate in genetics that two parents, in this particular case two plants, are going to have babies together, they're going to undergo sexual reproduction, we show that reproduction with the letter X, and we call that a cross. So the way that we state this is that Mendel crossed a purebred smooth seed plant with a purebred wrinkled seed plant, which basically means that he took pollen from a plant that would produce smooth seeds, and he used that pollen to fertilize a plant that would produce wrinkled seeds. If you do this, you might expect that the offspring, the next generation from this particular cross, would produce probably some smooth seeds and then some wrinkle seeds. Or maybe some in-between seed that was maybe a little bit smooth but also a little bit wrinkled. But he didn't get any of that. What he got is when he did this cross, all the offspring from this generation had smooth seeds. And so that's an interesting result. And so he tried this type of experiment with many other traits, and he kept kind of getting the same thing. Whenever he crossed one trait with another, as long as they were purebred for each generation, he would get offspring that were only one trait. So round cross wrinkled, all the babies were round. Purple flowers cross white flowers, all the babies were purple flowers. Yellow cross green, all the babies were yellow, and so on. 
this was an interesting discovery. So he took those seeds from that, what he called the first generation, and he planted them, and they eventually grew flowers, and he then so fertilized those flowers. He made those flowers fertilize themselves, which sounds gross, but in plants is not a big deal. So essentially what he's doing is he's allowing the plants to undergo sexual reproduction, but only with themselves, with his own genes. And so he is essentially taking the smooth seed that he got from that generation and crossing them with other smooth seeds. And so when he was done with that ex second experiment, he found in the next generation he recovered 7,324 seeds. Out of those 7,324, 5,474 were smooth and 1,850 were wrinkled. And that was about a 3 to 1 ratio of smooth to wrinkled. And then he repeated that same experiment with all the other traits. And he found that he would get that 3 to 1 ratio over and over and over again. So, for example, after the first generation that he did the round cross wrinkled and he self-fertilized the round seeds, he got that 3 to 1 ratio of round to wrinkled. But the same thing happened when he self-fertilized the purple flower from that first generation there. Purple cross purple, he again got a 3 to 1 ratio so in the next generation, he would get three purple for every one white flower. And, you know, let's take a look at the bottom one. So he did the same thing with plant height. He crossed tall plants with dwarf plants. The first generation were all tall. When he self-fertilized those tall plants with themselves, the next generation was a three-to-one ratio of tall to dwarf plants. So essentially what happened is that the second trait, the trait that was not apparent after that first crossing, appeared after the second generation. Um, have you ever heard the term that certain traits skip a generation? That's essentially what was happening here. Okay, so how did Mendel explain his findings? He said each plant has what he called two factors controlling the trait. We now call those factors genes but he called them factors. So he said each plant has two factors controlling the trait. The purebred smooth plants that he used as the ones that produce the smooth seeds had two smooth trait factors, which he denoted with a capital letter S. And he used the capital letter S because those that was a trait that was shown in the next generation. So he used a capital letter to denote that that trait kind of could mask the other trait, or what he called was dominant over the other trait. So he said, okay, so the smooth P had two smooth traits that it could pass on, and we're going to give each of those factors or traits the big a big letter S. So it had two big S's. The wrinkled P plant also had two S's, two factors that controlled the wrinkle trait, but he gave them the letter as in lowercase to denote that that trait was sort of masked after the first generation. So he called it recessive. He didn't think it was as strong as the smooth trait. And so when gametes were produced from that first generation, he said that each parent was able to pass on only one of its factors to its offspring. So the smooth pea plant could only pass one of its big S's to its offspring, and the wrinkled pea plant could only pass pass on one of its little s's to its offspring. So when a big s from the smooth plant and a little s from the wrinkle plant got together in order to form a zygote through fertilization, then this first generation would have then one of each, uh, he called it this F1 generation, the, the son or daughter generation. Each of them would only have, would have one of each traits would have a big S and a little S. And because the smooth trait he said was dominant over the wrinkle trait, which he called recessive, then all the babies would be smooth because that's the trait that it would overpower the other trait. And so over the next generation he then self-fertilized those offspring that had that were smooth but had one of each factor a big s and a little s and so when he self-fertilized that next generation which which he called the f1 generation and he got an f2 generation 
which would be the grandchildren generation, then he showed his results this way, where again, each parent was able to give only one of its factors to its babies, and then those gametes, the eggs and the sperm from the, or pollen from the plants, would get together, and you can show how they come together in something called a Punnett square. And so seeds that inherit at least one of the big S's are going to be smooth, and those are the ones right here, and seeds that inherit um, both small S's are going to be wrinkled. And so out of four babies that the parents would get, three of them would have smooth seeds and one of them would have wrinkled seeds at a three to one ratio. Okay, so let's talk about some terminology. So when Mendel was talking about these factors that control a trait, we're talking about genes. And when we're talking about genes, we're going to know that there's different forms for a gene. And those forms of a gene are called alleles. So, for example, for eye color, the alleles could be brown or blue or green. Those are the different forms of a trait. The trait being eye color, the forms would be the blue or brown or gray. When it came to the pea plant, the trait would have been seed shape and the forms would have been smooth or wrinkled. So those are the alleles. The alleles would be smooth or wrinkled. So alleles are the different forms for a gene, and they occupy the same space, which we call the loci or locus or position in a chromosome. So for example, the gene for flower coloration would be found in the exact same spot in the exact same type of chromosome in all plants, but there could be different alleles for color for the flower. So some of them might have the purple allele and some of them might have the white allele. He also used the terms dominant and recessive to explain whether a trait is going to basically overpower another trait. So dominant traits are those that are expressed preferentially over another trait. For example, brown fur color or brown fur allele will be expressed over white fur allele, so brown fur would be dominant and the white fur would be recessive. By convention, we use a capital letter for the dominant trait and a lowercase letter for the recessive trait. So oftentimes the first letter of the dominant trait is the one that is used to represent the, the trait. So for example, for brown coloration, brown starts with B, so we use the capital letter B to represent brown, and then we use the lowercase letter B to represent white. The other two terms that we need to be familiar with are both the terms genotype and the terms phenotype. Genotype basically refers to the genetic constitution of an organism with respect to a trait. So in other words, what are the the genes that you have that control that trait. What do your genes look like? So in this particular case of this brown mouse, its genotype is big B, little b. This particular mouse got a brown allele from its dad and a white allele from its mom, and so its genotype is big, big B, little b. Its phenotype, on the other hand, the physical trait is Brown, that's the trait, brown fur. The phenotype is the actual physical trait that an organism has or displays that is controlled by its genes, by its genotype. And the genotype would be, what does its genes look like? And then when we're looking at genotypes, there are going to be three different types of genotype that an organism can display. If both letters in its genotype are capital letters. If the organism has both dominant alleles that it has inherited, we call that homozygous dominant. Homo meaning the same, so homozygous meaning it has two of the same alleles. And if the both alleles are dominant, it's homozygous dominant. Similarly, if the organism has inherited both recessive traits, both recessive alleles, we say that it's homozygous recessive, but if it's received one of each, we say that it's heterozygous. Hetero meaning different. In its genotype, it has the two different types. Homozygous dominant and homozygous recessives are purebreds. And heterozygous is what we call the hybrid because it is a mixture of two things. Okay, so that's just some terminology. 
Let's practice some pun, what we call Punnett squares. The Punnett square is basically the tool that allows us to predict the genotypes and phenotypes of any particular cross. Let's perform a cross between two yellow seeded plants that are both heterozygous for the trait. Now remember, heterozygous means that their genotype consists of two types of allele. In this case, a dominant allele for yellow pea seed color and a recessive allele for green pea seed color. Also remember that we denote the dominant alleles with an uppercase letter and the recessive alleles with a lowercase letter. Now to prepare a Punnett square, all possible gametes made by the parents are written along the top and side of a grid. The combinations of egg and sperm, or in this case of ova and pollen, are then made in the boxes in the table, representing fertilization and the production of different offspring. What the Punnett square does is it allows us to predict the probability of an offspring having a particular genotype and therefore a particular phenotype. So from this Punnett square, we can predict that there is a 1 in 4 chance, or 25%, that this cross will result in a homozygous dominant offspring, a 2 in 4 chance, or 50%, that it will result in a heterozygous offspring, and a 1 in 4 chance, or 25%, that it will result in a homozygous recessive offspring. These are the genotypic ratios. You can also write them as a 1 to 2 to 1 ratio. We can also predict the phenotypic ratio of the offspring, what they will look like. 3 out of the 4, or 75%, have at least one copy of the dominant allele, so they will be yellow. And the other 25% have only the recessive allele, so will have the green phenotype. Again, we can use ratios instead of percentage to denote this. And that's it for this lesson. Talk to you soon.